<laughs> but okay, folks, so this is our final seminar of this term. And our theme, just to remind you, if you've done this for the first time, has been alternative and, and different approaches to the liberation. And my name is Anthony Reddy. I'm the director of the Oxford Centre for Religion and Culture. Uh, um, here within Regent's Park College, it's an internal part of the University of Oxford. Our speaker this, this afternoon, should I say, it's not evening quite yet, is Dr. Chris Shanahan, who is the Associate Professor of Political Theology and Director of Teaching and Learning within the Centre for Trust, Peace and Social Relations. And that is at Coventry University. The key themes in Chris's research include hip hop culture and youth identities, spiritualities of socially excluded young men on, on housing estates, and multiculturalism in, in the UK, theology and racism, and critical whiteness, and Christianity, urban poverty, and inequality. His first two monographs were Voices from the Borderlands, which I'm proud to say I commissioned for the book series I was then in charge of that back in 2010. And his second book is A Theology of Community Organizing, also with Routledge, and that's 2014. He has written 20 plus journal articles, there are a number of book chapters. And his current project about which he will be speaking today is Life on the Breadline. Subtitle is Christianity, Poverty, and Politics in the 21st Century City. And this work explores Christian action on poverty since the financial crash and was funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. On a personal note, Chris and I go back over 30 years. I think we first met at a racial justice meeting in Swanwick in 1993. I seem to remember. Yeah, I think in those days, I think you had less hair and I had more. Um, <laughs> Um, and these days, I think you see a touch more hair suits than I am, and I've gone bald. So we'll let people uh, uh, sort of theologically reflect on that as if they wish. But anyway, Chris, we are delighted that you are here with us, and we are now in your hands. Thank you very much indeed, Anthony. You're taking me back, and it's um, wonderful to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. Transforming structural injustice, theology, poverty, theology, discipleship in an age of austerity. I want to talk about five things in relation to the intersection between theology, poverty and discipleship today. First, I want to say a word or two about the project that Anthony has mentioned, Life on the Breadline. Christianity, poverty and politics in the 21st century. Second, I want to say a little about the, the nature and the causes of contemporary poverty in the UK, which is the focus of our research as a team. Thirdly, to summarize briefly one or two of the key findings from our three year life on the breadline project, most of which will be found in our newly published church leaders report and um, our six or seven month old um, Life on the Redline Policymakers Report, both of which are, are freely available on the project website. I want to then say a word or two about the development of a liberative theology of austerity age poverty, and to close by identifying one or two implications for discipleship before engaging in conversation. So that's the map of the, the way ahead. And I anticipate speaking for about 40 minutes or so. So Life on the Breadline is a three year project which officially came to an end about six months ago and ran from 2018 to 2021 and was funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. It was the first and to the best of my knowledge, still the only academic theological analysis of the impact that the austerity policies of successive governments, Liberal, Liberal Democrat, Conservative, and then Conservative governments have had on levels of poverty and Christian anti-poverty activism in the UK since the 2008 financial crash. The project was 
thoroughly fieldwork based. And I'll say a word or two about that in just a moment. Fieldwork ran from 2019 to 2021 in Birmingham, London and Manchester. And there are lots and lots of details on our project website. So a word or two briefly about that fieldwork. Approximately 800 people participated in Life on the Breadline, although that number is a fairly slippery number. It was probably larger than that, but that's a, a minimum, I think. We undertook six ethnographic case studies, themed ethnographic case studies, highlighting different Christian traditions, different ethical responses, different theological foci, and different aspects of poverty in Birmingham, London, and Manchester. We undertook about 60 or so interviews with grassroots activists in those three cities, interviewed national church leaders from 13 different UK denominations, surveyed 110 regional church leaders from England, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, and led together with our partners Church Action on Poverty, three national poverty consultations with about 90 church leaders, 2018, 19 and 2021. And so the insights and the reflections that I want to share today emerge from the work that I've done with my colleagues, Robert Beckford, Peter Scott and Stephanie Denning since 2018. Poverty in 2022. It's a litany of disastrous statistics that we see before us on the screen. I don't want to rehearse them. We'll go through line by line and blow by blow. They are nightmarish statistics that we are all too familiar with. At the at those statistics with 14 and a half million people living in poverty. COVID plunging more than three, more, three million more people in poverty, two and a half million people destitute. The question is, do academic theologians really get it? Do we really understand what these stats mean in terms of lives, in terms of communities, in terms of discipleship, in terms of action? Does what we see on the screen move us beyond rhetoric and what implications do such statistics have for church life, church practice and our understanding of theology and discipleship. Those are questions I want us to consider as we reflect together on the issue of theology, poverty and discipleship and the challenge to transform structural injustice. One of the things that we have been committed to as a Life on the Breadline team is correcting what I would argue has been a short-sighted approach to researching poverty by theologians and, dare I say it, by churches for a very long time. We're committed to working with colleagues, not least colleagues within the social sciences, to help us as theologians to see the whole picture. It's vital if we're going to respond in an adequate and deliberative manner to avoid reductionism, to recognize complexity, to understand the multidimensional nature of people's lives and people's communities and the challenges that such complexity has for church practice and for theology. So let's think a little bit about the whole picture. The first thing I want to say is that Life on the Breadline has reminded us again and again that poverty is intersectional. Going back to way before Kimberly Crenshaw wrote in the late 1980s and early 1990s, Martin Luther King, in his speech receiving his Nobel Peace Prize, touched upon notions of intersectionality without using the word. Thinking about poverty, Martin Luther King Jr. described it as a monstrous optimism 
octopus with nagging tentacles reaching into all the corners of our lives and the corners of our world. Two decades later, Kimberly Crenshaw, no, not two decades later, about 40 years later, I beg her pardon, Kimberly Crenshaw talked about intersectionality as a metaphor for the way in which different expressions of exclusion and inequality converge and combine and compound themselves. So what might that mean in relation to austerity age poverty in the UK? Well, let's think about that jigsaw image that we see on the screen, something that a friend of ours, Beth Waters, an artist from Bristol, created for the Life on the Breadline project. We see food poverty and low pay and zero hours and poor housing and fuel poverty and delayed benefits colliding and meeting together in a kind of a perfect storm. But too often theologians have only where they have reflected on austerity age poverty, just engaged with one face of the poverty that so many people in our country experience. So the first thing is to get poverty is intersectional and so our response must be intersectional rather than being reductionist and simplistic and one dimensional. Secondly, I think we need to move away from the Victorian nonsense that raised its head again over the last two to three decades of the deserving and the undeserving poor. We have had successive generations of prime ministers and political leaders, scandalously significant number of faith leaders who insist on individualizing and moralizing poverty. George Osborne, one of the architects of austerity, compared strivers and skivers people who were poor but were working hard to put money on the table, contrasting those kinds of families, he suggested, with the skivers that we saw on um, Benefit Street or um, comedy shows, so-called, like Shameless. Gustavo Gutierrez, the pioneer of liberation theology, reminds us that poverty is not about individual weakness, or individual moral failing, but about systemic sin. It is the inevitable outworking of neoliberal capitalism. And we saw that very clearly in one of our Life on the Breadline case studies in relation to Christian responses to Grenfell Tower, the tragedy of the Grenfell Tower fire and the death of the 72. Poverty as a byproduct of neoliberal capitalism was what we saw at Grenfell Tower. The poet Ben Ockrey reminded us of that when he said, if you want to see how the poor die today, come see Grenfell Tower. Grenfell Tower reminds us of poverty as a slow form of systemic violence. Theoretically, the church gets this. Denominations have committed themselves in the marks of mission first established in the mid 1980s to, to challenge structural injustice. The language is committing themselves to transform structures of injustice. But too often in life on the breadline, we have seen again and again theology meeting the needs of individuals, binding up people's wounds but failing to engage with the structures and the systems that lead people to the food bank in the first place. So poverty is intersectional, poverty is systemic, but poverty in an age of austerity is not an accident. The placard that you see on the screen there is a photograph I took just um, at the foot of Grenfell Tower. Why do we, the working class, have to suffer once again, asks the, the artist. Austerity was a clear, ideologically motivated political choice. George Osborne suggested that we're all in this together, but Justin Welby reminded us that whilst austerity might, austerity might be a theory for rich politicians and potentially comfortable religious leaders, it's a daily reality for the poor. But it's an experience that more of us 
that some of us have, have been, been damaged by much more than others. So women, single parents, black and brown Britons, people with disabilities have been far harder hit by austerity policies than people that look and sound like me. So austerity is not an accident. Poverty is, according to Gandhi, we remember that quote, the worst form of violence. And it's here, I would suggest, that we need to learn from the work of the pioneer of peace studies, Johann Galtung. If we think about the work of Galtung, Galtung talks of a triad of violence. He speaks of direct violence, person to person, verbal, physical, psychological, direct violence. He talks about structural violence, systemic damage or damaging policies that are built into the institutions and the processes and the policies that shape our society. And cultural violence, the use of culture, of film, of music, dare I say it, hymns and prayers and worship and biblical interpretations to underpin and justify oppression, what Gramsci might refer to as hegemony. So if we think of poverty as a form of violence, perhaps we can think in fresh about the violent damage of the Grenfell Tower fire, the violent damage of the 2012 Welfare Reform Act, the flagship of Tory austerity. Perhaps we can think of what's often referred to as the slow murderous violence or poverty, what Nick Davis has suggested, uh, equates to poverty killing like an assassin. Gutierrez himself, more than a generation ago, says something very similar. Poverty, says Gutierrez, means death, lack of food and housing, the exploitation of workers, permanent unemployment. Poverty destroys people, families, and individuals. So in light of that brief, all too brief, summary of the, kind, the, the nature and the extent and the complexity of austerity age poverty. Here on the screen now are some of the kind of traditions or approaches that we encountered during life on the red line, characterizing Christian responses to austerity age poverty. I think we need to recognize and life on the red line reminded us again and again that the church, perhaps more than any other voluntary agency in society, has been in the vanguard of responses to austerity age poverty. That needs to be recognized, in part because of the church's enduring levels of social capital, localized roots and networks and levels of trust in local communities. The question is, how has the church been using its unrivaled social capital in its action on poverty? We identified six overlapping approaches. These are not ideal tasks, they're not hermetically sealed, they often blur into one another, but they are traditions and models that are worth considering. I won't say much about them, but we can return to them if you would like to talk about them a little bit later on in any more depth. We spoke about the caring response, the dominant Christian response characterized by an ethic of charity and welfare, the food bank, the soup kitchen, the love thy neighbor social responsibility approach. We identified two examples of responses to austerity age poverty by churches that are focused very much around enabling and facilitating social enterprise on the one hand. So the emergence in Birmingham, for example, of startup companies where young unemployed men are servicing people's bicycles on the one hand, um, or people creating t-shirts and clothing on the other hand, but equally amongst some more conservative and particularly Pentecostal churches, a focus on business enterprise, building business skills as a way of working your way out of poverty. That relates to that 
image at the bottom of the, the self-help approach, a kind of almost conservative behavioralist approach to poverty and action on poverty that revolves around education and um, as a way of lifting oneself out of poverty. That we saw. We saw the campaigning approach, the kind of the campaigning for structural change, the real living wage. An example of that would be the work of church action on poverty. We see time and time again, but arguably not as consistently or as prophetically or as coherently or as boldly as necessary, but examples nevertheless of advocacy of church leaders, local and national speaking truth to power. An example of that, I think, was probably maybe five or six years ago when various church leaders spoke very eloquently, um, firstly about the payday loan company Wonga and the ballooning of personal debt, and secondly, about the exponential growth in the use of food banks relating to the disastrous introduction of universal credit. And then finally, and I have left it till finally, but we need to be honest, one of the approaches that we did encounter in Birmingham and London and Manchester is the use of prosperity gospel ethics and preaching as a response to austerity age poverty. We can come back to that later, but those in many socially excluded communities that we worked alongside, the appeal to a God who will bless me financially and get me out of my money problems now if I say the right prayers in the right church, in the right way, at the right time, and put some money in the plate is a form of hope for people who are at the end of their tether. Won't say any more, but those were the six approaches that we noticed. And so the question is, what does life on the breadline what do those responses to austerity age poverty, the kind of complex web of poverty that I've described, that we've seen rising in the UK as those stats on the first slide reminded us over the last decade, what do they have to say to us about theology and mission and ecclesiology? Well, these images from our Grenfell Tower case study, these photographs that I took maybe a couple of years ago now, Remind us that in an age of austerity, a church that commits itself vocally and verbally to a gospel of liberation, a church that commits itself to transforming structural injustice, must, absolutely must, view theology, poverty as a theological, a missiological, and an ecclesiological imperative. And it's that challenge that again and again we have tried to put to church leaders over the last three years. Those church leaders, those of us gathered together who would describe ourselves as theologians, um, face a moment of truth. Let's rewind back 40 years when sisters and brothers in South Africa within the churches, theologians and church leaders and church activists, faced their own Kairos moment in relation to apartheid, that moment of opportunity and judgment. Theologians in the UK, churches in the UK, after a decade of austerity policies and ballooning levels of poverty and inequality that are only getting worse. We're all faced with a series of uncomfortable questions, questions of, of, of theodicy. We can talk about the common good. We can talk about a God who has a preferential option for the poor. But where on earth was this God when Grenfell was burned to the ground because, because housing companies were allowed to get away with cheap cladding that caught fire too easily? When down the road, million pound apartments would never, never, never have caught fire in the same way. Where was this God when people lost their 20 pounds universal credit payments? Questions of theodicy, questions about the engagement of the church. What we have found in our church leader interviews is a deep commitment, but also a sense that the church 
has been to a large degree cushioned from the raw realities of austerity. So does the church really steal the cries of laments from excluded communities? We're asked as well, aren't we, about the social location of the church in an age of austerity. Are we in collusion with the establishment, consciously or unconsciously, or are we? that yeast-like liberative movement, that agitating minority that Kenneth Leach calls us to be. And in terms of our theology, we need to ask ourselves, is a commitment to a consensual, welfare-based vision of the common good where all people can flourish, is it good enough in a society that is dominated by structural injustice. And what's the calling of the church in the face of this? We face a Kairos moment and so does theology. And so it's time for us to begin, I would argue, to sow the seeds of a new theology of austerity, age, poverty in the UK. Something I don't think I would probably have said a dozen or 15 or 20 years ago, but the clock has been turned back and levels of poverty and inequality in the UK are worse than they have been since the Second World War. Such an austerity age theology of poverty needs us, I would argue, to be intersectional, interdisciplinary, thoroughly interdisciplinary, needs to be publicly engaged and not apologetic about that, needs to be prophetic and liberative and rooted and contextual. So what might such a theology look like? Well, in the remaining few minutes, I want to suggest just one or two thoughts or themes that I would argue on the basis of our reflections within Life on the Breadline need to play a part in this theology of austerity, age, poverty. The first thing I would say, which probably won't surprise you, is that theologians have got to get serious about complexity. We need to develop a theology that is thoroughly intersectional. I remember a great a cappella group um, many, many, many moons ago, Sweet Honey in the Rock, singing about intersectionality without using the term in a track called Chile, Your Waters Run Red, Red Through Soweto. The interconnectedness of struggle and oppression was clear in that song. But to date, Theologians in the UK have failed, signally failed, to engage in any depth with austerity, age, poverty. At the beginning of Life on the Breadline, we did, or I say we, it was my colleague Stephanie who did um, a literature search, and we did a word search for theological engagements with austerity and austerity, age, poverty. And there was virtually nothing it was low single figures of publications that had come out by 2018 on theology and austerity. We then did a similar search in terms of the use of the um, investigation of austerity within the social sciences. And it may not surprise some of you that we, we kind of lost count, I'm exaggerating slightly, but we lost count of the number of studies and papers and chapters and books within our social sciences on austerity. So what I want to suggest as a dyed in the wool political theologian is that we need to escape from our one dimensional approach to theology. We need to engage with contemporary poverty and learn from our social science colleagues and to do so in a way that is intersectional because only an intersectional theology of poverty can engage with the multidimensional nature of contemporary social exclusion. To date, the attempts within theology, academic theology at least, to engage with austerity age poverty have been single track approaches, honorable, but focusing almost exclusively on food banks and food poverty, which is understandable, but reductionist. Such an intersectional theology of austerity, age, poverty is needed if we are to help the church to address the multidimensional nature and the multidimensional damage that poverty causes. So I would say 
we need to develop an intersectional theology of poverty. Secondly, a theology of austerity age poverty needs to be an apocalyptic theology. I argue this because what we have seen in life on the red line and what we have seen perhaps emphasized even more greatly over the last couple of years during the COVID pandemic is that austerity has revealed, has uncovered pre-existing but often unrecognized patterns of structural injustice. It's lifted the lid on the experiences of social exclusion that, that my, my, my colleague Robert Beckford reminds me again and again are not new. The patterns of exclusion and poverty and inequality that austerity has highlighted are patterns of exclusion and poverty that have been experienced by black and brown Britons, by minority communities, by working class communities in the UK for generations. But we need a theology that is gonna unmask the cultural violence that justifies the policies, justifies inequality, justifies the piecemeal approach that the church often makes towards poverty. And that's where I think the work of people like Paolo Freire or Antonio Gramsci becomes important as we recognize again the importance of what Gutierrez refers to as conversion, conversion to the oppressed person and the exploited social class. We need to wake up if we're going to weave a new liberative narrative and preach a gospel that is strong enough and persuasive enough to win what Gramsci referred to as the cultural war of position and to make it clear that poverty is morally unacceptable. Only then can we begin to sow the seeds of a new liberative future. And so thirdly, that theology of austerity age poverty needs to be unapologetically liberative in deeds as well as words, walking the walk as well as talking the talk. Half a world away and four decades ago now, the Mexican biblical scholar Elsa Tamez spoke about a God who identifies himself with the poor to such an extent that their rights become the rights of God himself. That's the God that we have seen in the food bank. That's the God that we have seen living on the streets after Grenfell was burned to the ground. That's the God that we have seen lit surviving on zero hours contracts. That's the God we have seen in the family that have been made destitute as a result of government policies. We need in such a theology to move beyond words about the common good to a prophetic and consistent structural and systemically focused preferential option for the poor. The question is, is the church bold enough and brave enough to do that? Is the church committed enough to transforming structural injustice to prioritize defeating poverty in all aspects of its life, not just in its social action committees that trendy lefties like me might be part of, but in its discussions about structures, about resources, about clergy, about training, about the, the use of its money, translating Marx's mission into sustained systemic action. And all of that, that theology of intersect, that intersectional theology, that apocalyptic theology, that liberative theology needs to feed into our understanding of what it means to be a Christian community. We saw this again and again in our case studies and through the survey and through our interviews. Gutierrez is very clear. Only an authentic solidarity with the poor can provide a context necessary for a theological discussion with, of poverty. The question is, to what extent does the church in the UK express a meaningful, consistent, unconditional, long-term solidarity with oppressed communities here in the UK? The challenge, I would argue, is for us, and I mean 
us to move from being a well-meaning but disengaged institution to a liberative social movement. Over the last 10 years, we've seen initiatives from uh, st stemming from Pope Francis's first encyclicals about the development of what he referred to as a church of the poor. So we saw similar documents in the UK around the church of the poor. In the last couple of years, Methodism has established its Church at the Margins initiative. But with great respect, however important those national initiatives are, I would question how effective a top-down ecclesiological strategy can be in establishing solidarity with oppressed communities up and down the land. And that's why. I think we've got an awful lot within the church to learn from the asset-based community development approach that we encountered in one of our case studies in Hodge Hill in Birmingham. Working with communities, unconditionally including, unconditionally welcoming and valuing and building community as a step towards transforming structural injustice. So that's something about the nature of poverty, the responses that we have seen to poverty during life on the breadline, some of the challenges that our research poses for theologians, um, some of the something of the shape of the emergent theology of austerity poverty that we are beginning to work on within our project. But to close, one or two of the highlights from our church leaders report. What implications does all of this have for the way in which we think about and do church? The six points on the screen are some of the points that we raise in our church leaders report. The church needs to assert a clear, consistent, coherent, vision of God's preferential option for the poor, much more clearly, much more publicly, much less apologetically. The church needs to find a way of rooting itself in that ABCD vision of a church that is an agitating minority rooted in local communities. The church needs to use its social capital much more effectively to, to, to support sustained prophetic campaigning for structural change. Defeating poverty must become a central element of all church policies. We need to recognize the importance of liturgy and worship and Bible study and prayer groups within our congregational life as a means of challenging the cultural violence that underpins poverty in order to make it morally unacceptable. So something there, just a hint at some of the implications for practice, implications for discipleship as we seek to articulate this theology of austerity age poverty that enables us as churches to challenge and transform structural injustice. Life on the Red Line is working, even though the project has come to an end on developing a series of resources. We're working with the Joint Public Issues team, Church Action on Poverty, the Methodist Church, Church of the Margins team, um, rolling out our Life on the Breadline Lent course. And um, we're hoping to encourage more and more people and congregations to sign up to our Life on the Breadline Anti-Poverty Charter, both of which are on our website and we've just released our Life on the Breadline Church Leaders report. And as with any academic project, there are not just one book, but two books on the way. And as you'll see, we've also been working with an animation company to develop a series of creative ways of disseminating what we have discovered over the last three years. And those animations are there um, on our website too. So I want to say thank you. And um, I want to um, invite you to 
have a bit of a conversation with me. I'm just about just about there under time. So um, I was I was hovering because I was going to play that little animated video, but um, maybe we'll we'll leave that um, for another day. Thank you very much indeed. Um, it's been wonderful to be with you and to share something of the work of life on the breadline. Thank you. Lots of them.